Good morning. I'm happy to welcome you to yet another session of the NPTEL course Indian Fiction in English. In today's session, we look at this novel by Upamanyu Chatterjee titled English August. This was a highly successful novel and Upamanyu Chatterjee also went on to win the uh, Sahitya Academy Award for a book uh, for another work at a later period. Uh, the novel English August was published in 1988 and in 2004, uh, Chatterjee also won the Sahitya Academy Award. Uh, the success, the uh, interest that this novel has elicited across a wide range of audience had been uh, quite thrilling. And uh, this is a hilarious novel, it is an easy read, so unlike the difficulty that some of the post rush the or the post Kosh uh, a generation of novelists present to you. This is one such novel which could also come across as uh, highly accessible and uh, with an extremely hilarious kind of a rendition. We do have a student presenting today about this novel, giving a detailed insight and understanding of uh, English August. Uh, as a prefatory remark to that, it is important to understand who Agastya is. Agastya is an urban Indian male. He is also quite highly educated. Uh, he went to one of the prestigious schools and uh, colleges and also cleared the Indian, the, the coveted prestigious Indian civil service exam. We find that he is dislocated from everything around him, yeah, everything and everyone around him. And this is what marks Agastya, August, as a very different person altogether. It is the kind of alienation and the kind of distancing that he experiences is not similar to that of uh, Billy Bishwas from the uh, from Arun Joshi's novel. Unlike Billy Bishwas, we find that Agastya holds on to his job. He has a family, but at the same time, there is a way in which he manages to stay away. The word is perhaps you know stay rootless, stay dislocated from everything around him. He has only a careless disinterest in people and everything and even about himself to such an extent that he lies extensively. When asked about his family, he lies to others. He tells people that he had a wife who ha died of cancer. Yeah, to someone else, he would uh, rattle on with the story about his wife who eloped with somebody else. So he is someone who just does not care and uh, he can perhaps afford that. That is a point that we will come to address very soon. And he also has an irreverent take on everything. He seems to belong to a generation which cannot take anything seriously. He is holding an important position as far as his administrative job is concerned. He is an IAS officer posted in, the, in a rural, uh, one of the rural hinterlands of northern India. But we find that he is unable to take an interest in his job or on anything which is happening around him. And he does not take himself his job or the people around him seriously. Some critics have wondered whether this kind of a portrayal is peculiar to novels who are middle class and English educated. We do find this tendency at least in some of those novelists to present protagonists who are dislocated, who are rootless from the contemporary uh, and immediate realities around them. And some have argued that the likes of Agastya are products of a CBSE system of debased empiricism because it does not encourage you to engage with things, it only prepares you to retain information and produce them as and when required, which is what Agastya also does quite meticulously in spite of his disinterest, in spite of him being buried in his own self, pursuing his own pleasures, we find that he is able to quite meticulously retain the administrative uh, uh, hierarchical notes. He knows what to do about the procedures. He has a, uh, he's quite efficient that way that it's impossible to find fault with him. And this question of what education has given Agastya is something that you should perhaps also attempt to ask and answer based on your reading of the novel. And Agastya's social background is very privileged. He comes from a fairly well off family from an urban setting. For someone to be able to afford to live like Agastya, it does require a privileged background. And there are three things which seem to interest him, marijuana, masturbation and meditation. These are the things that he does on a daily basis in spite of this high profile job that he holds. And the strange thing is that he does not find any need to change himself. And the novel presents 
these three things as a continuous obsession that Agastya has, but it does not really interfere uh, much with his job. It does not threaten his stability in terms of a job security or in terms of a, uh, an economic uh, stability because he has the luxury and the time for uh, reasons obvious, privilege being one of those. He also belongs to the right social and cultural capital and he is able to afford to enjoy all of these things and be irreverent and remain dislocated without really threatening the many securities which hold him together. And there is a brief episode where Agastya ends up violating a tribal woman. The, the episode is not focused centrally because it is also presented as an inevitable need because Agastya is forced to live in an otherwise sexually frigid zone. So, is it, it, is it the same privilege which has given him even the right to violate this woman and then go almost scot-free after the incident? There is certainly a connection between the background and the kind of things that he ends up doing, that he is allowed to do and that he can afford to do. In one of Tharoor's writings responding to whether there is a Stefanian uh, literature or not, he points this out. Caste and creed were no bar, but these categories determine your share of the Stephanian experience. Given that the author of uh, English August Upamanyu Chatterjee is also a Stephanian, it is not possible to see uh, an interesting connection over here that caste and creed, while they remain insignificant to this urban privileged young man, we find that those categories also determine his share of life experiences. They also determine his choices and the ways in which someone like Agastya can get away from many, many things which would perhaps mean the end of life for someone who is less privileged, who, someone who is not as privileged as he is. As we are talking about English August, in the context of Indian fiction and English, it is important to ask this question about how we can locate Indianness in this work. One of the critiques about English August is that it was written for a Western audience. It is export quality prose. We find a detailed introduction in this work, to in, an introduction to civil administration. Yeah? Whether this is for the Indian audience or the Western audience is uh, uh, debatable. We find a similar, re uh, similar account, a similar uh, telling in uh, uh, Shashi Tharoor's novel, Riot as well where we are also introduced to the intrinsic systems of uh, um, Indian caste system and the, intricate, the intricacies of how the administrative uh, business operates. Yeah. There we of course have another foreign character, non-Indian character, an American woman to whom the character of Lakshman is introducing India and the many uh, insider details of India. But again, one begins to wonder whether this is for this, uh, whether the intended audience is native or foreign. The jokes come across as very, very urban in the jokes that Agastya cracks with his friends or the kind of things that he finds humorous in a day-to-day -day context. They would perhaps make sense only to an urban audience who share a similar background. There is a total disconnect with the non-urban setting where they may perhaps even fail to see the humor, fail to see the relevance of many things that Agastya thinks about and uh, does on a daily basis. Though Agastya is placed within India, though he is an Indian citizen himself, he did his entire education in India and he is thoroughly Indian in that sense, he feels out of place when he is in rural India. And this is an interesting point because there are only certain regions within the nation where one would feel comfortable as uh, a person. One would find that there is something shared with the others from that area. And certainly the place where Agastya is posted now is a place with which Agastya shares nothing in common. He feels completely out of place. He is unable to find a friend and he always feels that he is an alien over there doing something which neither he nor the others are able to figure out. 
and this form of uh, depiction has also invited a lot of critique. Aditya Patajarji has uh, referred to this as a form of orientalizing within India. And this is not really about the place, not really about the place where uh, Agastya is uh, posted as an IAS officer. But it is also about the attitude, the also about the disinterestedness in understanding what the what the rest of India is about, what the other is about. For example, there is an instance where he interchangeably uses the character of uh, uh, August, Agastya, interchangeably uses Govan and Anglo-Indian. This tendency to see, say for instance, the Christian, the Anglo-Indians and the Govans as undifferentiated, it also amounts to an orientalizing tendency within India as far as Aditya Patarji, one of the critics is concerned. As I wind up these prefatory remarks, let me draw your attention to uh, an essay by Raymond Williams titled Forms of Fiction in 1848. In this essay, Forms of Fiction in 1848, Raymond Williams attempt to analyze the 19th century novels to find out whether they are better or worst. And this is based with respect to the extent to which their narrative mode is indicative or subjunctive. I find this distinction useful in entering certain discussions about novels like English August. Leela Gandhi also refers to these two modes of narration in trying to evaluate the Stefanian novels. Indicative novels, according to Raymond Williams, they simply offered an account of what had happened and what was happening. Yeah, there is nothing more or nothing less to it. It is about a series of incidents that had happened and a series of uh, incidents which are continuing to happen. There are no surprises here for the reader. The reader is familiar with what is being presented, with what is being narrated. On the other hand, the subjunctive text, Williams argues, they went a little bit further in gesturing beyond what was socially or culturally available. And by doing that, they also symptomatically betray the constraints of their literary cultural milieu, the literary cultural background, thereby helping us to understand the pleasures and limits of the world in which we find and recognize ourselves. So of course, there is a familiar element even in the subjunctive narrative mode, but located in this familiar world, we are also encouraged to understand the pleasures and limits of the world which we ourselves inhabit. And then Leela Gandhi uses Raymond Williams' essay to bring in an important evaluation in the context of uh, Stefanian novels. She writes, Stefanian novels are boringly, if skillfully, indicative of the sensibility through which the newly elite Indian middle classes recognize their community in the nation. So there is nothing subjunctive about Stefanian novels, including English August, which is what Leela Gandhi seems to indicate, because they do not gesture anything beyond what is socially or culturally available. And the true mark of a novel, like Raymond Williams pointed out, whether a novel is better or worse, is evaluated on the basis of many such things. I resist from making an evaluation over here. While I tentatively agree with Leela Gandhi, there is also no denying the fact that this is certainly a novel which brought in a different narrative mode to the body of Indian uh, English writing. But however, this distinction seems to be a useful one while trying to see how we would look at fiction written particularly in the post 1980s to try and see how they are pushing beyond their boundaries. How significant the kind of liberation and the kind of uh, radical narrative thinking which they brought about are in the contemporary. With these, I also invite Anantajit for sharing his views and his insights on uh, his reading of this novel English August. I encourage you to read the novel so that you would get a complete sense of the discussion and will be able to relate better with the many points which are being raised and discussed. Thank you.
Good morning. Um, I will be presenting on Ubhavanyu Chatterjee's uh, debut novel in published in 1988, which is called uh, English August and it is about a young Indian civil servant, an IAS officer who is posted in a place called Madna, a fictional village which is on the hinterlands of rural India to complete his uh, uh, civil service officer's training. We could of course say that it is a postmodern novel in some senses, but also some reviews say that it is a realist novel. But uh, the basic idea is that it tells the story of a man who is rootless and uh, caught in a vicious mental state of his own that he does not know how to come out of it. So, basically what happens in the novel is that there is a person who is interested in nothing and who thinks it is a virtue or at least we believe so. So, it is the story of a sensitive man caught in the reality of the world. He is trying hard to reconcile his inner world with the outer world and that is the essence of the story. I will read out something from the uh, novel that the incertitude of his reactions to Madhna, his job and his inability to relate to it, other abstractions too, his place in the world, his future, the elusive mocking nature of happiness, the possibility of its attainment. So, these are the problems that he is contemplating throughout the novel and uh, so what does he do when he is bored, but he, he, he cannot find meaning in what he is doing in the place. There are three things that this guy resorts to o although he does know that it is not going to fulfill him. So, there is marijuana, masturbation and meditations. His name is Agastya Sen, but he has an urge to, 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 to be westernized as in he grew up in a school where, where the ways were so western so that he, he always had a urge to become western. So, his friends mocking him used to call him August or English. So, uh, even the title of the book English August is actually referring to Agastya himself. So, he is very ruthless, uncategorized and uncertain and this uncertainty fills the novel as in if you read you can know that this novel is not going anywhere, it is it's, it, the novel itself is uncertain, so is the character and so is the, so is the intention behind the novel, it is it's very uncertain. So, we are uh, looking at his journey from rootlessness and uncertainty to yet rootlessness and uncertainty. So, this guy is a very urban Indian male child who is currently 24 years old and he, he cannot come to terms with the reality of, of, of a world which he always thought existed just in documentaries about the poor and movies. So, so when he has to confront that reality what, what, what goes in his own mind is, is the main theme. What Ubhamanyu Chatterjee says is very interesting that he keeps on repeating that this novel is not about India, this not novel is not about the place, it is it's, it's not about the politics, it is it's completely about a guy who is lost. So, it is it's, it's a, it's a very human novel in his intention if we are to go by what Obamenu Chatterjee says. He is also ruthless because of his upbringing in the sense that he is the child of a quite wealthy family, child from a quite wealthy family, a Govanese Christian mother a Bengali Hindu father brought up in Delhi, now posted at Madhna, who studied in some place um, which must be very close to Darjeeling. So, he, he cannot make sense of himself or, or, or his world. So, this is a common idea of a genius who is who is constrained to a constrained to the time and space of, of, of modernity. The people he meets in Madhna the bureaucracy and also the poor people. So, there are only two kinds of people who he meets if we are to make categorization for the ease of understanding. So, one is the kind of people who are less than them, less than him. So, less than him in the sense they are very corrupt while Agastya is almost 
straightforward, not always, but yeah. So, or else the people are worse than him, worse off than him in the sense of their material surroundings and etcetera, etcetera. So, Agastya slowly comes to understand that everybody's life is more or less similar to him, his in the sense that they also does not know what to do, they also does not know where to look up to and etcetera, etcetera. But what makes Agastya different from the other people is, is, is the kind of authenticity if we are to use the uh, existentialist term, authenticity in life that you do not go before after uh, false beliefs. So, that, 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 that the idea is to be authentic, to, to, to face life. So, that is what Agastya said, uh, does throughout the novel. So, that is what makes him quite different. The primary thing is that there is no unfolding narrative, there is no plot, there is no fright tags triangle which you see with a rising action, falling action etcetera, etcetera. So, it is it's much like a diary entry or a journal, it is it's very all over the place so to speak that that the what, what matters only in the in the story is that it is a banality of non occurrence, nothing happens, nothing happens throughout the novel except we are we are we are we are the narrator or the reader is following Agastya through his job, through his training, through his problems, through his almost depressed conditions, through the nights which he just lies down on his bed and stares on his ceiling and smokes weed. So that that's that's what goes throughout the novel. Weed has a very interesting uh, observation that the life of an IAS officer, the life of the bureaucracy is very similar to something that happens without nothing happening really. So, the officialness of, of what happens quietly seeps into the story, which makes the story itself seem like a mini bureaucratic world, where there are just <laughs> delays and roadblocks and still delays and still delays and still delays. That the story is emptied of significance as if there is a filter through which everything that he sees is passing through and everything that gives meaning is sucked up by that filter. That Roland Barth says that there is a dilatory area in every text where nothing much happens, but it serves to give a context and a grounding to the text. But apparently this novel as Bede argues is fully a dilatory area from cover to cover. Also, there is a distinction between a prioritic code and a hermeneutic code on, on in reading the text that that what keeps somebody's attention to a text is, is whether something happens, whether somebody can ask questions on why this happened, what is going to happen next, what would he have done etcetera, etcetera. So, that part of asking questions to keep the text moving is is, is called the prioritic part. So, we argues that the novel does not have that part that, that keeps us glued to, to the novel. So, there are so many references to other texts within the novel such as uh, Bhagavad Gita and Marcus Aurelius meditation. So, uh, one of the quotes is that many branched and endless are the thoughts of the man who needs, who lacks determination. So, that is from Gita. So, this same exact quote is provoked so many times over and over in the novel that 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 the lack of of determination and 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 the endless ways in which the mind wanders and uh, curiously the first uh, beginning sentence of the novel also repeats once more as as it is in the middle of the novel so if we are to read the novel keeping in mind Indian ethos, we can see that it is circular, the, um, very much like uh, Finnegan's Wake which begins with half the beginning sentence, half the ending sentence. So, goes on in a circle. While this is not about the country, this is not about, about a community, this is more, this is of course about a person, but the Indianness is on the background always. Oh, uh, most most times it is used to provoke a comic relief to the novel, but there is an irreverent take on 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 Indianness that 
uh, the rootlessness and alienation which are the main themes of the of the novel it it always comes from having known india as something else too the narrator knows multiple worlds of what what india is and and uh, without india as a background the the novel wouldn't have progressed so while upamanyu chatterjee says that's about it's only about the person it's the formal structure of the novel always takes india into consideration making so many crude jokes about india at times but that's how the novel progresses so uh, on some versions of english august there is an introduction by akil sharma uh, introduction to the novel so he says that what is problematic with indian fiction in english when we try to talk about it is is that most of these works try to pretend that that is the soul or uh, a representative of the indianness in the indian fiction while it should be really focusing on the fiction it's it's turning out to be pretentious about being indian so and meenakshi mugarji uh, in his uh, authenticity uh, uh, that that paper says that chatterji had to add the title uh, add the subtitle an indian story to this novel so the entire title is english august an indian story so the problem with the reading of this thing as a boring text is that maybe the author was the, no, the author of this uh, paper was trying to see a mean sense relation in reading a text that when you approach a text there should be a meaning which you can take out of the text after you have read it but the idea is of english august you can't make sense of it in a summary or a review or 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 a paper it's the experience that one has to go from the cover to the end cover so but but when the novel ends we we still we still don't have agastya getting rooted somewhere he's still very very uncertain about what happens and etc etc 